Now, notice that we're elaborating on a protected group here, and the protected group is sex. We started out with no discrimination based on sex. That's one of the categories. Then we enhance that with no discrimination based on pregnancy, and now we're going to go another direction to sexual harassment. But before I talk about sexual harassment, let me say that, this, that the basis for sexual harassment law is racial harassment. Immediately after the Civil Rights Act was passed and employers who had previously been segregated were compelled to hire African Americans, you had terrible instances of harassment. And originally the courts didn't quite know what to do with this. They could understand, I, I refuse to hire you because you're African American. Well, that's a violation. I fire you because you're African American. That's a violation. But what happens if your coworkers hang a noose on your locker or, or, or paint KKK on the wall? And these things, this comes right out of a number of cases. Well, the courts eventually figured out that even though those things were not direct employer actions, they still violated the spirit and intent of the law. Well, starting in the 70s, people began to extend that notion to the, to the sexual harassment of women, uh, where women were subjected to, to different types of harassment, and, uh, and the courts agreed that that also violated the law. So when we talk about sexual harassment, there are two types, quid pro quo and hostile or offensive environment. Quid pro quo is a Latin phrase, this for that, quid pro quo. Again, as I told the earlier class, under American Bar Association rules, if I can say it in Latin, I get to charge more per hour. So quid pro quo is the exchange of job favors for sexual favors. So I'm the boss and I say, hey baby, sleep with me and I'll promote you. Or hey baby, don't sleep with me and I'll fire you. Um, note that if, if it's the exchange of job favors for sexual favors, it's got to be done by someone with the power to grant or withhold job favors, right? It must be done by a supervisor, an agent of the employer. <coughs> and since it is done by an agent of the employer, it's a strict liability situation. The company is always responsible. If it's quid pro quo, there's no defense. You just got to make the person whole and, and pay the, the damages. Now, an anti-harassment policy, the existence of an anti-harassment policy, really doesn't help you in that case. I mean, if the boss demanded sexual favors from an employee and fired her when she wouldn't cooperate, the fact that you can point to an anti-harassment policy doesn't change your liability. But you ought to have it just for deterrent value, if nothing else. And then we'll see that in other kinds of harassment, it's, it's critical. All right, the second form of discrimination is hostile or offensive environment. Now, before I talk about hostile or offensive sexual harassment, I get complaints with some regularity, or I see complaints with some regularity from people saying that my boss created a hostile environment because he made me work. <laughs> you know? In other words, just because you and your boss don't get along or just because your boss uh, yells at you if, if, if he or she is displeased with your work, that may be hostile in the, in the common sense, but it's not a hostile environment in the technical legal sense because the hostility has to be based on protected group membership again. So if I harass you because I don't like you, you may think that's hostile, and it may be hostile, but it's not technical hostile environment. But if I harass you because of your gender or your race or other protected factors, it is a problem. So, the second form is hostile or offensive environment, which is defined as unwelcome sexual advances or unwelcome conduct, verbal or physical, of a sexual nature. Unwelcome sexual advances uh, means that if it's a consensual relationship, it's not a violation. It's still dangerous in the workplace, especially if it's between supervisor and subordinate. But even among uh, peers, think about it. 
let's say these two people are madly in love, but then they break up and one of them wants to pursue the other and the other doesn't want to be pursued. All of a sudden, what was once a consensual relationship ain't consensual anymore. And if this pursuit is happening uh, in the workplace or on duty, then it's suddenly becoming sexual harassment. Supervisor subordinate dating should be prohibited, primarily because of the danger of quid pro quo. When someone is involved with their supervisor, how do we know that that's truly consensual? Isn't there a possibility of coercion or a possibility of favoritism? And the other thing is, and this is not the legal issue, but it also creates resentment in the workplace um, because other people think, well, this person is getting you know, all, the, all the goodies because they, uh, they're sleeping with the boss. Um, perception of favoritism. Now, can you prevent coworkers from dating? Probably not because of their privacy, but you could apply nepotism rules. So just as you wouldn't want to have husband and wife uh, working together, uh, or spouses, I, I should say, working together in the same department, you could also say, well, we're not going to allow people who are engaged in a romantic relationship, sexual relationship, uh, in the same department. All right, now, remember that we said that sexual harassment was unwelcome sexual advances or unwelcome conduct. That term, unwelcome, means something. And it has both a subjective and an objective component. Subjective means, I didn't like it. Objective means, and, no, and a reasonable person in the place of the victim would also be offended. So let's say I work in, a, in an office and I come up to a coworker, not a, a subordinate, and I say, pardon me, but would you care to go to dinner tomorrow night? And that person jumps up and says, you can't ask me to dinner, that's sexual harassment. Well, is it? I mean, standing alone, that invitation, which didn't involve any kind of touching or any kind of, of, of misconduct, uh, it was clearly subjectively unwelcome to her. But would it be objectively unwelcome? Would a reasonable place in the, person in the place of the victim have objected? And the answer is probably not. That's probably not sexual harassment. But if I ask her out all the time, you know, every day I'm, I'm hitting on her, well, then that's change, that changes it. Once it becomes pervasive, then it becomes sexual harassment. I once had a case where a, a museum director called me up and said, oh, we've got this big problem. Uh, we have these two workers, and, 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 the, and the woman accused the man of sexual harassment. I said, why? What did he do? Well, he has a picture on his desk. It seems he recently got married and he and his wife went to the Caribbean for their honeymoon. And there's a picture of the two of them in their bathing suits standing in, on the dock in front of the boat. And her uh, coworker objected to that. And I said, well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to sit down with the coworker and tell her to get a life. <laughs> because no reasonable person in her place would have responded that way. Now, if the, if the photograph was nude or something like that, sure, it's a different story. But uh, there has to be an element of objectivity to any uh, characterization of unwelcome. All right. In addition to being unwelcome, both objectively and subjectively, sexual harassment to violate the law must be serious or pervasive not isolated or incidental. And the classic illustration here is Clinton v. Jones. Now, I don't, some of you are probably too young to remember the epic saga of Bill Clinton and Paula Jones, but to refresh your memory, when Bill Clinton was the governor of Arkansas, he went to a hotel like this one where they were having where the, Illinois, uh, the Arkansas Tourism Department was having some kind of convention. And a low-level employee who was sitting at one of the tables handing out brochures was a woman named Paula Jones. Uh, Clinton found her attractive, asked her to come up to his hotel suite. She did, and there the stories diverge. Uh, he says that he just chatted with her. She says that he dropped his pants and uh, invited her to perform a sexual act upon him. Uh, she declined, she says, and uh, 
and left. Both parties differ on a lot of what happened or didn't happen, but both of them agree that she left, he didn't hand touch her, he didn't uh, pursue her afterwards, he didn't uh, retaliate against her at all. Now, the Clinton lawyers filed for summary judgment. Summary judgment is a legal motion that says even if we accept as fact her side of the story, we still contend that the law would not consider those facts to be sexual harassment. And the court granted the summary judgment motion for Bill Clinton. The judge said he didn't touch her, he didn't harass her afterwards, he didn't do anything, and that one incident standing alone was not severe enough to rise to the level of, of sexual harassment. Uh, now, a lot of us might disagree. If it happened to you, if it happened to somebody you cared about, you might say, well, that's pretty bad, and, and I think it should be a violation. The court disagreed. I will say this. It was not home cooking. The judge was a woman, Susan Weber Wright, and she was a Republican appointee. She was not one of Clinton's appointees. So it was appealed to the Eighth Circuit, and before the Eighth Circuit had a chance to rule one way or the other, the Clinton, the Clinton legal team settled. But that's, that, that focuses on the issue of severity. If there's no physical contact, contact, no touching, the courts are not likely to find that a single incident is bad enough to be uh, sexual harassment. But if there's physical conduct, that's going to be bad enough every time. Or if it's not serious, if it happens over and over again, if it's pervasive, that's going to do the trick. So that's the outline of sexual harassment. Now, a verbal harassment, including comments on body, clothing, appearance, dirty jokes, descriptions of your love life, all of that can be sexual harassment. You must prevent your, protect your employees from harassment even by third parties. The classic Xerox machine guy comes in every day and uh, harasses the receptionist kind of thing. Um, what is the company's liability for sexual harassment? As I said before, quid pro quo, strict liability. But if it's created by a coworker or a third party, the company is not liable if it did not know about the conduct and had no way of knowing. What's the best way to prove you had no way of knowing? You had an anti-harassment policy and a complaint policy and the employee didn't complain. She just quit and then filed a, a, discri a discrimination charge. So that's coworker. If a supervisor doesn't do quid pro quo, but does hostile or offensive environment, there's two possibilities. If the supervisor does it and there is a tangible job detriment, like a demotion or a discharge, you're back to strict liability. But if a supervisor does it and there's no pardon me, tangible job detriment, the company is liable but can raise an affirmative defense to damages. The affirmative defense is that the company has a widely disseminated and effective internal complaint process um, and the company has to react. I, I make a reference there to City of Boca Raton, Florida. This is a case called Farragher versus Boca Raton. Ms. Farragher was a 19 or 20 year old uh, lifeguard for the city of Boca Raton. And she worked among the lifeguards and apparently it was sort of like Baywatch. You know, you had a, you had a whole lot of very fit and attractive young people dressed in skimpy bathing suits and uh, much hilarity ensued and she got pretty tired of it and she filed a complaint with her boss. The problem was her boss, the head lifeguard, was a grizzled old veteran of about 22, and he simply did nothing about it. He just said, ah, you just got to live with it. Boys will be boys kind of thing. A few months later, when she's real tired of living with it, she went to the city manager. The city manager reacted promptly, fixed the problem, but it was too late. Because the company's policy said, we forbid sexual harassment, you got to go to your boss and complain. She went to her boss and complained and nothing happened. She was still entitled to damages, even though 
Some months later, a higher level person addressed the problem properly. So, the, the takeaway for you guys is, if you're in a supervisory position and someone complains to you about sexual harassment or you become aware of it, it's your problem and you have to do one of two things. Fix it or turn it over to somebody else who can fix it. Any supervisor who knows about it, that knowledge is imputed to the company. Okay, so if, an, if the employee, if there is such a, 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 a policy and the employee doesn't take advantage of it, that can create a defense. All right, let's pursue it a little further. Discrimination based on sex, sexual harassment. What happens if, it's, if the harasser and the victim are both of the same sex? This is on Kali versus Sundowner Offshore Services. A fellow named Ankali went to work for Sundowner on an offshore oil drilling rig. Now, I don't know how much y'all know about the oil in biz drilling business, but it is not the most delicate, sophisticated, cosmopolitan business in the world. In fact, it's the only business I know where roughneck is a job title. And Mr. Ankali was a small, slightly built, soft-spoken man, and he was brutalized by the oil-filled workers. Um, they would simulate raping him in the shower. They just did all kinds of horrible things to him. And he wanted to file a lawsuit. Problem was, at that time, there was Fifth Circuit precedent, and this happened in Louisiana, which is in the Fifth Circuit, that said that there's no such thing as same-sex harassment. Now, he could have sued the workers individually, but what's the point of that? They didn't have any money. You know, oil-filled workers, they get paid on Friday, they're broke on Monday. And the first thing they teach you in law school, don't sue an insolvent defendant, right? So his lawyer decided to, to, to just make new law. So he sued under Title VII anyway. And the reason he did so was because in the Ninth Circuit, a decision had approved same-sex harassment. And when there's a split between two circuit courts of appeal, that's how you get to the Supreme Court. So once again, the Supremes Showed you why they're the Supremes, nine to nothing. They had no problem with this one either. They ruled in favor of Mr. Oncali. The opinion was by Scalia, right? You wouldn't think of such a conservative judge would write a positive opinion in favor of a worker, but he and everybody else on the court said that Title VII did apply to same-sex harassment. And uh, they did say that the conduct must be severe and not just horseplay. They gave the example of a coach slapping a football player on the butt when he sends him out on the field versus a boss slapping his secretary on the butt. Those, those are two different things. Context matters. Uh, but but Ancali did, in fact, um, um, create a cause of action for same-sex harassment. Okay. So that's race and sex. Let's talk about religious discrimination. Basically, there are relatively few companies that discriminate overtly based on religion. You know, we don't hire Catholics here. Baptists need not apply, that sort of thing. That doesn't happen. Where you get religious discrimination claims is failure to accommodate. Title VII requires that you accommodate a person's religious beliefs and practices unless to do so would be an undue hardship. And the classic case here is TWA versus Hardison. In that case, TWA was an airline. Again, the younger people don't know. They've been out of business for a long time. But TWA was an airline. It was a union airline. And uh, Mr. Hardison uh, went to work for TWA. And of course, because it was union, there was a big seniority system. And uh, he had to work nights and weekends, because when you're new, you don't have the seniority to get day shift. Well, he had no religion when he started to work, but he subsequently converted to the Worldwide Church of God, which had a very strict Saturday Sabbath, like Seventh-day Adventists or like, like Orthodox Jews, strict seventh, uh, sa uh, Saturday Sabbath. And he said he couldn't work on Saturday. And they said, well, we can't give you that day off because it would screw up our seniority system. And that case goes to the Supreme Court 
And the Supreme Court said that in matters of religious accommodation, anything more than a de minimis inconvenience on the part of the employer, they don't have to accommodate. If there's no reason why you, you couldn't accommodate, then you should accommodate. But if it causes you any kind of hardship, you don't have to. Um, and that's basically it on religious discrimination. Now, religious organizations themselves, of course, can quote unquote discriminate. You know, if you're a, um, you know, if you're a Mormon uh, business and you hire only Mormons, well, that's perfectly okay. But if we're talking about a regular sex, uh, a secular private sector employer, you can't discriminate and you have to accommodate unless it's a, a, a more than a de minimis cost. All right, the next law, the next category is age. Back in the 60s, the Studebaker assembly plant in South Bend, Indiana went out of business and somebody did a longitudinal study of those laid off workers and they found that it was dramatically harder to get a new job the older you were. No surprise, but, but this was the first uh, study that clearly proved it. And based on those findings and many others, Congress passed the ADEA, the Americans, the Age Discrimination in Employment Act. And it basically said that you cannot discriminate based on age against people who are 40 and older. So clearly you could, you could pick a 22-year-old over a 32-year-old, that wouldn't be a violation. But if, if because of age, you pick a 30-year-old over a 50-year-old, then that would be a violation. Now, the, the biggest impacts of the ADEA, no mandatory retirement. You know, for, for many, many years, 65 was it. You hit 65 and, and they cut you loose, but that is not legal now in general. Now, there are still some public sector and some safety-related exceptions. Uh, the most common violation claim is an older worker replaced by a younger worker. The Supreme Court clarified for us that a comparable need not be under 40. If you've got a 50-year-old replaced by a 30-year-old, that's an obvious case. But what happens if you have a 59-year-old replaced by a 41-year-old? Can that be discrimination? The answer is yes. If there's more than about a 10-year gap in age, the Supreme Court says that you can still base an age claim on those facts. And the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA. This is the, the, the last protected group. The general rule is no discrimination against a quali qualified individual on the basis of disability. Discrimination includes not making reasonable accommodation to the known physical or mental limitations of an otherwise qualified individual with a disability who is an applicant or employee unless the covered entity can demonstrate that the accommodation would impose an undue hardship. So, not only can you not just discriminate, you also have to accommodate to allow people with disabilities to perform the essential functions of their job unless to do so would be an undue hardship. A disability has three definitions. A physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of, a major life act, of the major life activities of an individual, having a record of such an impairment, or being regarded as having such an impairment. And that last one is tricky. I can't make you black or white. I can't make you male or female. But I can make you disabled simply by regarding you as disabled. In other words, if you have a medical condition that doesn't, objectively speaking, prevent you from doing the essential functions of your job, but I just think it's icky, or I don't, I don't like it, or I, don't, I worry how my customers will react, then by perceiving it as a disability, I bring you under the protection of the law. A qualified individual with a disability is somebody who meets the basic requirements of the job and with or without accommodation can perform the essential functions of the job. So I'm qualified if I can do the essential functions of the job or if I could do it with a reasonable accommodation. 
Now, Texas state law generally tracks the, these protected groups. Other states have similar laws, but many cover employers of fewer than 15. The federal law applies across the board only to employers that have 15 employees, except for age, which is 20. And they have to have that 15 or 20 employees in any 20 weeks of the current or preceding calendar year. Texas tracks that. Many states apply it even to much smaller employers. Some states, any employer is covered, or any employee is covered. 